Hello and welcome. In Warsaw, on May 3rd, 1791, the Parliament of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, in the presence of King Stanislaus Augustus, has passed the first modern constitution in Europe. It was forged not without a drama on the chamber's floor, in heated debates and among accusations of sneaking in absolutist regulations that threatened ancient liberties of the political nation. The king swore an oath to the constitution and then led the great majority of the members of parliament to the collegiate church of St. John the Baptist nearby. Marshals, bishops, senators, other officials and the gathered public swore to uphold the constitution. The Tadeum Laudamus hymn, a powerful song of praise and gratitude to God broke out. On that day, something new and significant took place in the Warsaw streets that inspired the nation. It was immediately perceived as a founding moment of a renewed political community. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this event that marks 230th anniversary of adopting the most remarkable Polish constitution. I am delighted that this is happening in collaboration with George Washington's uh, Mount Vernon that preserves Washington's home and legacy. As President Biden stated in his address to a joint session of Congress last night, America is an idea. It emerges from the opening words of the American Constitution, we the people, and the respect for these two splendid laws of government, the American and Polish Constitution has brought us here, and I'm very grateful, Kevin, for making it possible. Joining me for this conversation are Kevin Butterfield, Executive Director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington and Mount Vernon, and the author of The Making of Tocqueville's America, Law and Association in the Early United States. There is also Richard Butterwick, Professor of Polish-Lithuanian History at University College London, and a renowned expert on the 18th century history of Poland and beyond, author of The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, 1733-1795, Light and Flame, and also very brand new book on the Constitution of the Third May. Dorota pietrzyk Reeves, professor at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, political philosophy, and her recent book, very telling, Polish Republican, Republican Discourse in the 16th century, published with Cambridge last year. Martin Radu, Emeritus Professor of Central European History at University College London, and well, excellent expert on Habsburgs and their empire, author of the Habsburgs, the rise and fall of the world power published again last year, if I'm not mistaken. My name is Wojciech Kozłowski, director of the Pilecki Institute, and this is Strides Towards Liberty, the May 3rd Constitution of Poland, George Washington, and the spirit of republicanism. Welcome to our round table. Welcome to all the speakers. Hello. Let me begin with an opening question to all of you. And as we discussed earlier, I will ask Martin perhaps to contribute first, and then I hope we'll just, the others will join in. And we want to set up a little bit of the context of the constitutions we're going to discuss today, and especially the constitution of 3rd May. The late 18th century appears to begin an age of written constitutions that has lasted up to this very day. In your opinion, Martin, where did it all come from? What happened in the Western Hemisphere that brought written statutes of government about and gained so much traction over time? What happened? Just your mic, start the mic. I knew there was something I'd forgotten. Um, I want to look at it in, in terms of just two periods when writing, become, writing about what government should and shouldn't do become fashionable. 
The first is in the late 12th, early 13th century, when we have um, the Charters of Liberty. And across Europe, people are putting together, noble, noblemen and barons are putting together documents that are attempting to hem in the power of government. The first starts, I think, in Bavaria in the 1180s, and we can trace it through uh, to places like Hungary, England, Sicily, uh, France, etc. The second moment, of course, is the 18th century, when we have the constitutional fashion, um, where constitutions are put together in America, in France, in Poland, that we're celebrating today. And this continues right through into the 19th century. And its greatest monument is, I think, the Stutz lexicon of uh, Rotek and Velka, written in 1834. It goes through many, many different editions. And that is the standard collection of European constitutions. And if you're a Habsburg minister of the interior and you're told it's time that a constitution was uh, put in place, then you literally, as Baron Pillersdorf did, you reach to your bookshelf, pull down uh, the Stutz lexicon and copy out uh, whatever bits that you think might apply. Um, so across Europe, across parts of Europe, we see this constitutional fashion. And even in places that don't really yield a constitution, we have a very great interest in constitutionalism. Um, and I think of Hungary in 1790, after Joseph II has died, we have tremendous pressure for a constitutional settlement. It's supported by Leopold II, there's a great flood of people to attend the diets and the county assemblies that will select members of the diets. And when the Transylvanian diet meets in Cluj in 1792, the diet is entertained by three ladies uh, representing each of the branches of government who sing a three part song in celebration of the separation of powers. And I think this is very important for two reasons. Firstly, and this links directly into what uh, Wojciech has asked, what is happening here? Firstly, I think we have the emphasis, the extraordinary influence of Montesquieu. And Montesquieu's idea of the separation of powers into three, something which he mistakenly thinks the British constitution uh, uh, um, uh, replicates, and then I think we have a constitutional, um, a constitutional moment, a moment of tremendous constitutional intensity in discussion. And we'll see this in Transylvania, we'll see it in Hungary, we see it in America in the 1780s with tremendous uh, interest in town hall meetings about what a new constitution we should have. We see it in France in the Cahiers, of 1789, and we see it in Poland as well, in the discussions, very wide popular discussions that lead up to the four year uh, sign. Um, and that I think are the two points which really promote constitutions and constitutionalism, the influence of Montesquieu and the very wide popular interest in constitutions and constitutional arrangements and I think that's what makes it different from the earlier moment, the moment when charters of liberty are being foregrounded. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin? Well, I couldn't agree more with what you just heard in, in terms of the description of the late 18th century. Uh, in the American context, I would add one element, and that's a good century and a half of experience operating under colonial charters. Uh, laid the groundwork for Americans to think in terms of written documents as ways to safeguard liberties, to preserve structures of power. Uh, and by the 1770s, it, it, it is nearly uh, a given that Americans in, in the various colonies that are becoming independent will draft documents, nearly all of them do. And in fact, by the time you get to 1790, nearly all of them have done it not once, but twice. They've had an initial constitution and replaced it with a better one. Uh, the, of course, the formation of the US Constitution in 1787 is, is a part of this, but it's absolutely, the way Martin described it, a broader social 
embrace uh, from the bottom up too. You, the, you see ordinary people drafting constitutions for their own clubs and associations and societies as well uh, in this late 18th century moment. The one thing Americans add uh, that becomes a, uh, an absolute expectation for all subsequent constitutions is in 1780, Massachusetts not only writes down their constitution, but then submits it directly to the people in some form or another, in this case, town meetings, uh, to vote to approve it. Uh, not through the usual channels of power through the assembly, but through a new channel of power. And that is, becomes a given too, the, the separate embrace of the constitution through a separate, uh, in this case, ratification process. That Those two things, that it's written and that it's ratified separately or, or made, made to be fundamental law in a way that's different from all other laws, those become universal uh, ideas across the American um, colonies become states. Thank you very much. I think Dorota was ready to, to take the floor. How about political philosophy then? Okay, thank you. Um, not much to add to this, but I think that the first written constitutions, the American, the Polish, and the French, uh, were primarily a response to the period of a deep crisis, which had a different nature in each case, but also some commonalities. Um, I think it was above all the crisis of the statehood, in some respect at least, um, American colonies uniting against the British monarchy, the Poles uniting against uh, the three absolute monarchies, which were a vital threat to the very existence of the Polish state. And finally, the French rebelling against their own absolute monarchy. So the first historical factor is uncertainty and rebellion along with a deep political crisis. The second, I believe, is faith in reason and in institutional devices based on reason which suddenly discovers natural inalienable rights of the man and the citizen and thus brings a great promise um, of liberty and equality. So the language of natural rights is used, as we know, prior to the constitutions in both the French and the American declarations, which is not the case in Poland, of course. Um, uh, secondly, in the Western context, written constitutions are formulas to political liberties of the community. So this is very crucial. Now, if we move on, uh, as the question invites us to, uh, in the 19th and the 20th centuries, uh, many states which sprang up in Europe um, under the influence of the same current of uh, modern ideas, Montesquieu was already mentioned, um, uh, could scarcely avoid um, giving a precise formula to their political liberties, um, as well as the institutions that should guard them, along with the formula of a representative democratic government. So this becomes, uh, as if, a norm uh, in the 19th century. So I would say that written constitutions tend to be a response to crisis, turmoil, a radical transformation, for example, a regime change. Um, and if we look at Poland in the 20th century, Poland had three written constitutions which marked moments of a significant breakthrough. First is the re-emergence of the Polish statehood, the constitution of 1921. Then we have the regime change into people's democracy, the communist state in the constitution of 1952. And finally, the second regime change of 1989 and the constitution adopted in 1997. So I think this is a very telling example. Also, I would say that the idea of a written constitution uh, reflects very much the concept of the social contract as well as the concept of the balance of power. So this is where constitutionalism uh, as, as an idea uh, develops. Uh, so when it comes uh, to the social contract, we have kind of way of thinking that the body politic is formed by a voluntary association of individuals. So this is very modern. This is no longer Republican. It is a social compact uh, by which the whole people in a way covenants with each citizen and each citizen with the whole people. So a very Rousseauian concept. Um, and this is for the very clear purpose that all shall be governed by certain laws for the common good. 
Um, and it is the duty of the people, therefore, in framing a constitution uh, of government uh, to provide uh, for an equitable mode of uh, making laws, interpret and execute the laws. Thus, constitutionalism again. And most often the drafters of, uh, of a constitution are political elites uh, who may or may not act on behalf of the people. So for example, the new constitution of Hungary can hardly be said to be a bottom-up development, yet it is supposed to signify a new beginning in the history of Hungary um, and its own understanding of the meaning of a constitution. Thank you. So summing this all up for now, before, before Richard takes his, uh, his first voice, it's like either fashion or crisis or, well, certain practice of living together outside, uh, outside Europe. What is the, what, what else or what, what, what part of, of these three elements you can, you can relate to? Or maybe something completely different, Richard? Thank you very much. Uh, the constitutions and the constitutionalism of the later 18th century are part of the Enlightenment. Now, this is a very banal thing to say, so I'll make that a bit more precise. They are part of the late or highly mature Enlightenment. The early Enlightenment, as it emerged in the Netherlands and in Britain and in France at the turn of the 17th and 18th centuries, was radical, it was philosophical, it was universal, it was cosmopolitan in the fullest sense of the word. And it had very little practical impact. But by the time we get to the second half of the 18th century, the Enlightenment has calmed down a bit as it is spread in time and space. It's not just about asking questions of universal import, which could turn the world upside down. It's about finding practical solutions to problems in local, regional, and especially national contexts. And so the enlightenment of the later 18th century is more about solutions than it is about criticizing and demolishing things. Obviously, the French Revolution in its radical phase will be something rather different. It's something of an anomaly in terms of the history of the Enlightenment. So the later Enlightenment is also more moderate. It is less inclined to challenge religious uh, religion, especially revealed religion. It offers the opportunity for dialogue and constructive debates between enlightened monarchy and enlightened republicanism. And the Polish-Lithuanian constitution of the 3rd of May 1791, I think is an ideal illustration of the trends of the late enlightenment within this wider context of what is sometimes called the Atlantic Revolution. Certainly a time of intellectual ferment and criticism, but also a concern to tackle real problems. The cosmopolitanism of the early Enlightenment is very often addressed to the solving of problems in national contexts, and this will have a kind of overlap with the early stages of national movements, and not only in Central and Eastern Europe. Montesquieu has quite rightly been raised as crucial to later 18th century constitutionalism. Montesquieu himself, a French judge, was very much a product of the early enlightenment. And that is clearest perhaps in the Persian letters. But his impact, the impact of the spirit of the laws in particular, falls in the second half of the 18th century and inspires all kinds of different responses depending on the local circumstances. And he is absolutely a part of the Polish constitution of the 3rd of May uh, particularly in the setting out of a classic statement of the division of powers uh, between the legislative, executive, and judicial powers. Thank you. Building on this <clears throat> idea of Atlantic Revolution, 
of those trends that can be uh, noticed and both on the American shores and in Europe. And all this concept of enlightenment that already opened up to some sort of moderate conversation and discussion. Um, I would be very happy to, to move into a little bit of comparative history or constitutionalism um, at work, uh, which basically means that I would like to look at American and Polish constitution in the context that where they emerged. And in a certain way, I want to refer to what uh, Dorota already mentioned, that is, that every single constitution is a product of its time and it has to respond to certain challenges and difficulties that are simply ahead of the particular uh, community that, uh, that charts that uh, constitution. So I would start with Kevin and the question, why, what were the, these challenges that the American constitution responded to? How was it conceived and what sort of polity did it, did it imagine? Thank you. Yes, uh, there are, as I mentioned, uh, already a lot of constitutions uh, in the American political uh, sphere long before 1787, uh, beginning with independence uh, in 1776, we see constitutions drafted uh, and then in many cases replaced. The, uh, I want to point out uh, to Dorota's point about crisis, uh, that is the genesis of the constitution of 1787. It is a sense of uh, impending disaster uh, in the American scene uh, that uh, George Washington is, is one of many who felt this, but he felt it powerfully. He had retired here to Mount Vernon, where I am today, uh, after winning the, the revolution as commander in chief, uh, expecting never to serve again, uh, but a sense of national crisis was looming in the mid 1780s. Uh, one letter that George Washington wrote to an aide of his and became, became a secretary, uh, David Humphreys, is actually at your university, Durot, so that's why I wanted to use this today. It's in your special collections. Uh, it's, this is a letter from Washington describing this sense of crisis in December of 1786, uh, and he points out the significance of constitutions to this crisis. It is but the other day we were shedding our blood to obtain the constitutions under which we now live, constitutions of our own choice and framing, and now we are unsheathing the sword to overturn them. The thing is so unaccountable that I hardly know how to realize it or to persuade myself that I'm not under the vision of a dream. What he's describing here is uh, small scale in the grand scheme of things, but small scale rebellions in the American Commonwealth. Uh, in this case, in Massachusetts, he's referring to what's known as Shays Rebellion. Uh, and a sense really that these democratic constitutions that Americans had drafted for themselves um, were perhaps insufficient that chaos would emerge, that democracy would run amok, uh, and Washington feels that fear. A second fear that he feels, uh, and others uh, at, at the time, uh, hence the Constitutional Convention of 1787, uh, is best described actually in, in a book uh, in, a, in a school of thought recently. This is the word peace pact. Uh, that is that the American Constitution is a, a better way of, of, of bringing the 13 states into league with one another and to be honest, they referred to Poland more than once as an example of what happens if they, were, if they allow themselves to become weak in, 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 in the international sphere. Um, Daniel Leonard, actually a loyalist, uh, says that the, the Americans, once they became independents, would find themselves easy prey and would be parceled out Poland-like. Uh, and Americans, too, uh, Edmund Randolph, writing after the Constitutional Convention, uh, is, was worried of partitions of our country if they didn't have a stronger national union. Uh, and so the constitution of 1787 was uh, a response to perhaps an excess of democracy uh, and, and the need to actually have a somewhat more uh, uh, limited uh, element of popular uh, involvement in government uh, and, uh, and yet still be Republican in nature. Uh, and, and the need for a stronger national union uh, and worries that if they lacked that, uh, they would simply become victim uh, to other European powers. Uh, Great Britain, France, and Spain uh, still have strong presence on the North American continent. Those two fears uh, really drove forward the American constitution. Thank you very much. And I, I would address similar question to, to Richard. I mean, how about Polish constitution and what sort of fears are there? Because what I, from what I heard, 
from Kevin, it looks like Poland was actually an example of being a weak and state in, 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 in some sort of excessive, un, badly working, I don't know, republicanism or democracy that should be amended and that the Americans wanted to actually avoid the mistakes that we have made, meaning the Poland. So how do you see that? Well, yes, the international reputation of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, or as it was generally called, Poland, uh, was dire. Uh, it was a warning rather than an example. Well, that changed with the constitution of the 3rd of May on both sides of the Atlantic, as we shall see later on in this discussion. Now, in order to explain the challenges faced and the vision of the polity in the constitution, I'm going to make use of the contemporary English translation of the preamble to the constitution. This was made by the Polish minister in London in 1791. It, it's not a perfect translation. It's not entirely accurate, but it's eloquent. And in the case of the preamble, uh, it works. And different phrases in the preamble uh, can show us the kind of crisis faced by the Commonwealth and also the kind of solutions that were reached for. Now, the first phrase is persuaded that our common fate depends entirely upon the establishing and rendering perfect a national constitution. Now, that's important because it shows just how much faith there was in the force of constitutions in order to make things better. Uh, so important, in fact, that the common fate would depend on a perfect constitution. It's what better argument could you have for the importance of later 18th century constitutionalism? Then, convinced by a long train of experience of many defects in our government, well, this is the sort of honest look at themselves and the willingness to admit that they're not perfect and there are many things to, uh, to put right. That too can be compared with the uh, experience of the uh, confederated states uh, over the Atlantic. And this also relates to that sort of poor opinion uh, of Poland before the constitution. And willing to profit by the present circumstances of Europe and by the favorable moment which has restored us to ourselves free from the disgraceful shackles of foreign influence. Now, this is referring to the Russian hegemony, uh, which had kept the Commonwealth in shackles effectively since the end of the Great Northern War uh, in 1721, and which had got a great deal tighter. Uh, during the reign of the Empress Catherine II. In fact, the form of government had been explicitly guaranteed uh, by the Russian Empress from 1768 onwards. And at the start of the great four years same, or parliament of 1788, that Russian guarantee had been thrown off. And that was possible because of the state of Europe. Russia was engaged in war with the Ottoman Empire in the South, and with the Swedes in the north, and was also conflicted uh, with Prussia and Great Britain. You could hardly have had a better situation in which to exercise sovereignty and to reform a form of government which experience has shown to be very much in need of amendment. And then, prizing more than life and every personal consideration, the political existence, external independence, and internal liberty of the nation whose care is entrusted to us. Now, here we have a declaration of amor patriae, uh, which is to exceed any other consideration. That's a very much part of the Republican heritage. Uh, but also we have this three sets of objectives which sort of loosely correspond also to those sort of three objectives of political power, which loosely correspond to the three, uh, to the three powers in government. The political existence, well, that's pretty uh, clear, uh, that there's a danger that everything could be destroyed. And external independence, uh, this is to do with the collective freedom uh, of the uh, national community, but also the internal liberty. This is where that sort of Montesquieuian or even proto-liberal element comes in. There is no abandonment of the individual liberties of 
particular citizens, quite the obvious. And then the idea of the nation and the sense of responsibility for the entire nation. This will come through later in the move from delegation to representation uh, on the part of the legislative power within the constitution. Desirous, moreover, to deserve the blessing and gratitude, not only of our contemporaries, but also of future generations. Well, this is the appeal to history, uh, a sense that history is watching, and this is something that will be a lasting beginning. That is a powerful emotional argument. In fact, the whole preamble has something of the character of a political sermon uh, as much as anything else. For the sake of the public good, for securing our liberty and maintaining our kingdom and our possessions. This is a kind of repeat of those three things that were mentioned uh, earlier. So the repetition is also uh, an important rhetorical strategy. In order to exert our natural rights, this is important, that concept is there even if it's not foregrounded. Uh, and it's part of the changes in Polish political discourse that have taken place in the previous uh, generation with zeal and firmness we do solemnly establish the present constitution, which we declare wholly inviolable in every part, till such period as shall be prescribed by law, when the nation, if it should think fit and deem it necessary, may alter by its express will such articles therein as shall be found inadequate. In other words, there is the possibility, which is defined later as every 25 years, uh, for the constitution to be amended. In that sense, it actually makes the constitution of Poland a great deal more flexible than the American constitution, which has lasted with its amendments, because those amendments would have been much easier to make at least once every five, 25 years. And then finally, and this present constitution shall be the standard of all laws and statutes for future diets. And later on, there's also uh, the detail uh, that previous laws not in accordance with the constitution are automatically repealed. So therefore it is the fundamental law of the uh, political uh, community derived from the values of the political community. It's about the form of government. It's about the uh, way in which citizens relate to each other, uh, but it, it will also be about the form of society. And the vision of the polity uh, comes in two parts. Articles two to four are about the social structure, uh, about the nobility, the burghers, and the peasants. And this is obviously a clear difference to the American constitution. But if there's time later, we can talk about how these things were able to evolve. And then articles five to eight are about the forms of government, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, and the way in which they relate together. So that is the, 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 those are the challenges expressed in the preamble uh, that the constitution was addressing. And those were the two directions in which the polity was outlined. Thank you. So let's perhaps stay within this uh, spirit of, uh, of comparative perspective. And my question to, to Dorota, um, Richard, in his in his recent book, quotes an almanac published in still in 1791, uh, very quickly after the uh, after the uh, promulgation of the of the constitution, and it's and this almanac compares four constitutions: the English, which served others as a model; the American, which was formed from it; the Polish, which made use of both. And in the end, the French, which has had these three models together before it. So there is an idea that all these constitutional projects are intertwined, they're linked. Do you really see the connection there? Do you follow this perspective by the contemporaries? How do you see that? Uh, yes, um, I believe there is much truth to this statement. Um, Certainly the American constitution arose from the roots of British constitutional experience, which goes back to the adoption of the Magna Carta and develops in the modern period, uh, mostly in the 17th century with the Petition of Rights, the Habeas Corpus Act and, and the Bill of Rights, as well as the Act of Settlement. Um, now the Polish Lithuanian constitution of 1971 was the product of 
I believe, the four and a half century struggle to both uh, restrain the king's power and to create institutions, which perhaps we could say today uh, were fundamental to a constitutional government, although this is not the language that would be used at the time. Um, the process of limiting the king's power began in Poland as early as uh, the 14th century. And Poland Lithuania emerged as a constitutional monarchy in a period when other major European countries, as we know, were reinforcing their absolutism. In fact, we, we need to uh, emphasize that Polish nobility got their Habeas Corpus Act much earlier than did nobility in other uh, European countries. So thanks to the concessions of um, the Polish kings, the Polish nobles gained an unprecedented position, which enabled them in the future um, to suppress their king's absolutist aspirations. Uh, it was indeed the spirit of Republican liberty, which fueled uh, this process. Um, by Republican liberty, I mean what in recent scholarship has been termed as either uh, freedom identified with non-domination or freedom as the absence of arbitrary powers. So I'm referring here to Philip Petty and Quentin Skinner, respectively. Now, going back into history, between the 13th and the 16th centuries, a number of small charters, charters of liberties, often called privileges as they were used, usually granted only to the nobility. Um, and statutes um, shaped a constitution of a limited mixed government. So this is a very um, long process, but also it starts very early on. So a kind of monarchia mixta of the Polish kingdom and later on of Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, emerges. And these various acts of um, Polish monarchs granting rights and liberties to the citizens of Rzeczpospolita uh, became a cornerstone of the doctrine of liberty uh, cherished by Republican writers on the one hand and the whole class of noblemen on the other hand. So it is interesting that during the second half of the 16th century when the Polish nobles had reached the height of their political influence, the rulers of neighboring countries were setting the foundations for absolutism. Now we have Stanislaw Kozakowski in the 16th century who says and emphasizes uh, really the difference between the Polish king and the monarchs in other countries, stating that in Poland, the Commonwealth is everything and the king serves the Commonwealth. In his understanding, the king was only the guardian of the principles of the Respublica. So this is the whole Republican spirit behind this long development that finally um, takes us to the end of the 18th century. So the roots of um, constitutionalism in Poland were certainly similar to those of England as both of them developed into monarchical republics uh, whose citizens could enjoy liberties greater than those of most Europeans at the time. Uh, now, a deep crisis of Rzeczpospolita in the 18th century led to yet another development, the first written constitution, which if adopted in different historical circumstances, would perhaps have led to a similar stable constitutional order as that of the United States of America uh, or Great Britain. But as we know, the second and third petitions of Poland stopped um, this development altogether. So I believe that similar Republican spirit can be found um, in the American constitution that follows the English tradition of liberty, but also reflects um, on the major ideas of the classical Republican tradition, including the concept of a mixed uh, government and the rule of law that is the best safeguard of liberty. Um, the American uh, founding fathers and uh, the framers of the Polish constitution were aware that their future constitutions would have to meet um, the various needs of their respective uh, countries. Yet I think that despite the fact that they were looking for different solutions to different national problems, they certainly borrow from um, the same basket of ideas, uh, the same comparable sources. 
And uh, so British political ideas were absorbed by the Polish reform faction, as well as the drafters of the American constitution. And both treated the English unwritten constitution as a model often read through Montesquieu. Why the French, um, the French short constitution uh, was certainly motivated more by the enlightenment ideas as well as the American revolution. And like the other two constitutions, it was intended to, um, to define um, the limits of power in the government. Thank you. So Martin, it all looks like everything starts and begins in, in Britain. In absolutist regimes, I believe your comparative perspective will be quite interesting here. So oh, <laughs> you say to all this, what was said? I mean, the first thing that struck me on reading the 1791 constitution was how short it was. And I think uh, one can say there are short constitutions and long constitutions. Uh, the short constitutions would be um, the French constitutions of 91, 1791 and 93. Uh, the US constitution, which I think is 5,000 words. Um, and we can compare those or contrast those with the Belgian constitution of 1831 which ran, runs to, ran to about 80 pages. The German Grundgesetz of 1949, which is 130 pages long. And the Hungarian constitution, proposed constitution of the early uh, 19th century. It took several decades to get there and then it was forgotten. And that constitution, constitutional document ran to nine volumes. Um, and that's largely because the Hungarians weren't sure about what the difference was between a constitution and a body of legislation. Um, and I think, nevertheless, that, that behind this lies um, a particular problem, which I think has been called the presumption of the law. And in much of Western Europe, the presumption of the law was that where the law was silent, the citizen was free. In Central Europe in particular, one has the idea of Freie Verwaltung, of um, the presumption of the law on the part of the state, that where the law was silent, the government king has the right to issue decrees. In other words, to fill the void, which is freedom in much of Western Europe, uh, to fill it with government edicts. And of course, in large parts in the Habsburg areas, where I'm most familiar, the body of edicts far exceeds any sort of statutory arrangements. Um, so the, the feeling in places like Hungary and in places like Germany in the aftermath of the Second World War, the feeling was that government needs to be hemmed in at every possibility. Every detail has got to be covered in order to um, ensure that personal freedoms are not eroded because if something isn't written down, then government might involve itself and take away the presumption of freedom. So I think that that explains differences in short and long constitutions. And I think well, it explains part of them at any rate. Uh, and I think it reflects to a degree on the background to Poland. The problem with Poland was not so much a powerful monarchy. It was, in many respects, a weak monarchy. And at the same time, Poland has not gone through the tremendous change that occurs in much of Central Europe, the Roman law revolution. It still remains a largely customary regime where rights are secured by historic observance. And I think that might go some way towards explaining 
why the Polish constitution of 1791 is short and why the Belgian constitution is long. Thank you. I'm wondering where does American constitution fit into that picture as if we take into consideration that there are a good number of other constitutions, the state constitutions before the, the, the United States constitution was formed, whether it's long or short is, is a good question uh, to, to proceed with. But let me, let me sort of continue this conversation about, uh, about certain cross-Atlantic networks, because apparently, uh, since we can tell that British, or well, the UK model is considered as a starting point for any new production of constitutions, and that there is definitely some interchange and an exchange of ideas, and perhaps, well, paying attention to one another. I mean, within the title of our roundtable today is a quotation from George Washington's letter from as early as July 1791, so like two, three months after the, the Polish constitution was, was adopted. And, and he talks about with, with certain, I think, appreciation. Uh, he talks about strides towards liberty that Poland has taken. So uh, maybe this time I will ask first Richard, let's talk about those networks and let's talk about perhaps the champions of the Polish constitution, who is responsible for this success and, and what were their inspirations? What did they take these inspirations from? Well, oh, thank you for raising this important point. Well, you've already mentioned George Washington himself as a champion of the Polish constitution. And I'm sure that uh, Kevin's going to be better informed than me on other aspects of the reception of the Polish constitution among other leading uh, American statesmen at the time. What I can say is that newspapers uh, in the United States of America, uh, in France, in various parts of Germany, and in Great Britain, uh, including in, uh, in Ulster, uh, were uh, full of reports of the Polish constitution or the Polish revolution. And these were overwhelmingly extraordinarily positive reports, not least with a degree of surprise, uh, which is also there in the quotation from George Washington. And you can certainly find your sort of usual suspects, such as Thomas Paine, uh, among the enthusiasts for the Polish constitution. Of course, it didn't go far enough. Uh, this was a, a sentiment to be found on the other side of the Atlantic, on the banks of the Seine, and also uh, on the Thames. There was criticism of, it, of the failure to abolish serfdom altogether in some places, although personally I believe that the radicalism of the Constitution in this regard has been underestimated. Uh, but I'd like to focus on two perhaps less likely characters, uh, conservatives in their way. Uh, one is Edmund Burke, uh, who set up the Polish revolution against the French. The French was bad because it was violent, because it changed things in a hurry. It had no respect for uh, the traditions of the past. Whereas the Polish constitution was good because it was an improving revolution. It was a gradual revolution. It didn't tear up the past, but it improved on it without destroying it. Now, this was obviously an instrumental comparison because Burke wanted to attack his opponents in the, uh, in the old Whigs from the perspective of the new Whigs. And a couple of years later, when the international circumstances have changed, he even said in Parliament that Poland might just as well be a country on the moon. So I don't think we're talking about any sort of very deep uh, sentiments here. But nevertheless, this emphasis on evolutionary change uh, is vital to the, uh, the vision of the polity and society that emerges from the uh, from the Constitution of the uh, 3rd of May. Uh, so Burke, I think, is extremely important. The King of Poland was absolutely delighted by this, and he sent Burke a medal. 
Uh, understandably enough, and the King of Poland's brother, the primate, Michał Poniatowski, uh, the Archbishop of Gniezno, actually met Burke in England at the time and admired his uh, reflections on the revolution in France. And the other rather unusual uh, admirer of the constitution was a Habsburg. And this was the Emperor Leopold II. Now, of course, he had a vested interest uh, that the Commonwealth would survive as a buffer against the expansion of Russia and Prussia. But he had himself something of a record uh, as a constitutionalist. He had at least toyed with the idea of a constitution for the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, where he was allowed to conduct his enlightened experiments while Joseph II in the main part of the Habsburg monarchy had to deal with the real problems of power. Uh, but it certainly does look as though Leopold sincerely admired the particular balance between monarchy and republicanism, uh, between law, uh, liberty, uh, and prosperity, which uh, you could find in the Polish constitution. So Leopold II, we shouldn't forget him either. Thank you, Kevin. From your perspective, any links, any ties uh, in George Washington's networks that lead to to Poland or to his perspective on what happened in in, in Poland at that time? Uh, yes, a great deal. I'll keep my answer somewhat short since Richard, Richard covered a very lot of this. The the reality is the strides towards liberty uh, quotation from from Washington. Uh, Part of our uh, title of, of our event is preceded by the words large and unexpected in this letter, large and unexpected strides towards liberty. Uh, and that is something that I noticed too in, in how people are responding to the news coming from Poland. We're losing you, I'm sorry. I, for some reason your mic is, is muted to a certain degree. How about now, am I back? Now we can, yeah, you, we can hear you, but we lost some of the volume, you know? I don't know what happened, maybe you just, yeah, just, someone tried to call me and it keeps happening. Uh, sorry. Uh, in my back, uh, are, are you able to hear me all right or should I? Well, still still sort of you, you're, you're distant. It's like you're talking through the wall. So I don't know what's... Why don't you move on to someone else and I'll see if I can fix it. All right, that. okay, okay. Um, so perhaps uh, we, can, we can move back to, um, to the question that I was, I was sort of considering here uh, about the, the networks. And I was thinking if, if Dorota, you have any, uh, any perspective on that, uh, on that issue, meaning if we start to think about the Polish constitution uh, as, as a modern project, as something that changes the, uh, the regular perspective on how, we, how the, the, the nation would define itself before, then, um, and we, really, we talk a little bit about that, but this is a kind of a big step forward and uh, Washington talking about strides towards liberty, uh, we're thinking about constitution as something that opens up new areas, avenues of, of political development. And do you do you fall? I mean, do you buy what what uh, Washington said? Do you th really think that this is a big stride towards liberty, however unexpected it is, if it was? All right. Um, so I would start with uh, sort of referring back to what was said before that the Polish constitution arose from the roots of many centuries of political experience and also the healthy attempt to accommodate uh, these elaborate traditions into new realities. Now, often these attempts, especially in the second half of the 17th century and the first half of the 18th century were unsuccessful, attempts to somehow modify the structure of the government so it can better respond to the new challenges, especially the wars that were uh, happening uh, throughout the whole 17th century and the crisis that was caused. 
So some of these attempts, actually a lot of these attempts to modify the government were unsuccessful. So we have to bear this in mind. Um, now, the May constitution did not survive for long, but uh, this fact is rarely recognized as its failure or failure of its framers. Uh, to the contrary, in the Polish uh, historiography, the constitution, despite criticism, of course, there is a lot of criticism, was widely evaluated as one of the most significant political achievements, which affected um, the political culture or perhaps political awareness of the generations of Poles. So it is, in fact, regarded as um, a huge achievement after all these attempts to reframe the government to um, uh, introduce some significant changes. We finally have the end of the 18th century and this final attempt to actually achieve this goal. Um, and also uh, referring to uh, Washington's statement, um, certainly the constitution was both modern and innovative. Uh, as much as it could be, if we take into consideration the social strata, the role of the nobility, and the tensions that existed among them. Uh, for me, the most striking element of the constitution is what um, Andrzej Fritz Modrzewski was asking for already in the 16th century, namely, in the constitution, Rzeczpospolita finally becomes the embodiment of the whole political community. It vests fundamental power in the will of the people and it postulates that the end and object of all power um, is the preservation and integrity of the state, the civil liberty and the good order of society. So this is how it is translated literally into English. And for this, it introduces the division of powers into three branches, as Richard already mentioned, the legislative, the executive and the judiciary. And of course, the impact of both Rousseau and Montesquieu on the authors of the constitution is undeniable. And through Montesquieu, the impact of the whole tradition of the English constitutionalism. So it certainly is uh, very modern. It has this modern component, which we cannot uh, deny. At the same time, as Richard already mentioned, uh, it was not a revolutionary act. The concept of um, the political nation could not be stretched at the time to include peasants, although Ignacy Potocki felt that it ought to include at least those who were free. The constitution could not achieve as much as Rousseau perhaps would want, uh, but it put the peasants under the protection of the law. It was perhaps the starting point for some greater reforms in the future, which would treat everyone in the Commonwealth as fully granted Republican liberty as uh, non-domination. But of course, this process uh, was uh, stopped uh, short. Um, so I think that the framers of um, the law and government of May the 3rd understood as well um, as their American counterparts uh, that a constitution is a framework, framework document which should prove adaptable to both the changing conditions and the needs of the most representative groups of the society. And maybe this is why the Polish constitution was short. Uh, now, in order to fully see the strides uh, towards liberty that the constitution opened up, we would have to indeed see detailed laws that would establish the new governmental structure and its adaptation to the social order. It certainly was a far-reaching constitutional compromise. Um, the moderate social reform, um, or reforms in fact, more than one, uh, which were to satisfy aspirations of the Polish burghers and timid anticipations of uh, peasants without at the same time challenging too much the anti-democratic, um, anti-revolutionary uh, attitudes of um, the reactionary factions in neighboring um, autocracies. So as far as the strides towards liberty, I would say that the constitution was a document drafted by the nobility, but perhaps for the first time 
was to serve the whole nation. Um, its framers tried to convey a message that the ruling estate of, um, of the nobles had both rights and duties. The constitution also confirmed the Republican tradition of the Polish political culture. Um, it was a special tradition of equality within one social group, the nobles. Uh, and now this concept, uh, uh, however, um, it was um, adopted to some extent, assumed that all those who were finally admitted to the common order should actively participate in the control of common affairs. So interestingly, this Republican spirit of Respublica comes back here. And the idea of active participation and direct contribution of all to the Commonwealth uh, became, uh, I believe, an important legacy of the first Polish constitution. And one of the most interesting uh, praises of the constitution came indeed from uh, Edmund Berg, uh, who said that Poland had entered a regular progress because founded on similar principles towards the stable excellence of a British constitution. So certainly there was a huge potential, which I think Washington recognized. Thank you. So before coming to, to Washington and to Kevin, just one, I know it's perhaps not a scholarly question, but still, this, you're the only one I can ask this question to. Do we Poles have a reason to be proud of that constitution? From the perspective of someone like George Washington? No, I'm asking Dorota now. I'm just, I'm just coming back here. Yes. I'm sorry? Uh, yes, certainly, yes, of course. We, we, we should be um, proud of it because it, as I said, it showed this tremendous potential that the and public the, state would still have. And I put the dot here. I just wanted to hear this, like, yes, we can be proud of that. Kevin, so, strides though it's liberty. Yes, the point I, want, I was hoping to be able to make, and, and I'm sorry for the technical glitch, is, is that Americans saw this as confirmation. Uh, really of their Republican experiment. Uh, Washington, uh, I, I liked the way that Richard was describing a mature enlightenment in the later 18th century. Uh, the idea that it, you know, this is the kinds of Republican um, possibilities were, were so, so clear and so powerful that even kings would choose to embrace them, right? Uh, and so to see that, to see a king, and, and, and when Americans are praising what they see in Poland, they're praising Stanislaus Augustus uh, every time. Uh, there's poetry uh, devoted to the man. Uh, and that's confirmation of Republican and this, the great experiments in Republicanism that Americans were very proud of, to see it begin to take root in places like Poland and to be chosen by, by the people uh, by nobility and by monarchs uh, was a great confirmation. They, they took great pride in, in seeing that. Thank you. And just building on that, I want to uh, refer to, to Martin. I mean, um, this, uh, this constitution, constitution of 3rd May, as Dorota already mentioned, is partially a failure, 14 months in existence. And then yet, it becomes a very powerful symbol that lasts for centuries, two centuries. And this is an inspiration, as I said in the beginning, for the entire nation to sort of upkeep the, uh, the aspirations to liberty. And at the same time, this is something considered by any occupant that comes to the Polish land as, as a thing you have to ban and you have to keep away, both Nazis and the Soviets and the communist regime. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, I think that, I think Dorota gave the <clears throat> indication as to why it's important when she said it shows our tremendous potential. I mean, if you look at Polish history in the 18th century, it is not a particularly happy experience um, of um, foreign intervention, of a very ossified uh, social structure. Um, Poles are visiting the West and they're saying, you know, how, how come the, the Britain and the Netherlands are so advanced? Um, how come we haven't got anywhere like this? Um, there's a feeling of backwardness that is very powerfully emerging in the 18th century. And what happens is, is that from 1791 onwards, Poles have got something that they can point to and say, this is our an achievement. We were in the business of establishing firm um, 
governmental foundations. Um, we were moving along a Republican road. We are moving towards being a free country in multiple senses of that. And so it provides, if you like, a retrospective beacon for Polish um, development. Monuments, after all, tell us not so much about a country's past, but about how a country sees itself. I and mean, I think Poland and 1791 is a statement after the event of what Poles themselves would like to be. And this brings me to uh, the concluding question for the round table. We have one question also pending from the audience, so I still want to address it too. But I, th I think I will ask, I will start with Richard. I mean, uh, we are discussing the late 18th century constitutions or constitutional projects. And what, as well, you are a scholar, you're an expert, but you also, you're quite vigilant, observant of what's going on all around the, the place today in the contemporary world. What is the legacy of those constitutions? What, what, what sort of, what is the meaning today? What is the significance of that, of the constitution, perhaps the constitution 3rd May today? How do you see this? What do you say to that? Well, the American constitution is sacralized. Uh, it is something that remains extraordinarily important to almost all Americans. And albeit difficult to amend, it has moved with the times to provide that framework. And it has served to defend against possible abuses of power very, very recently. Now, the American Constitution has played a role which the Polish Constitution of the 3rd of May could have played had it not been forcibly overthrown uh, after 14 and a half months. The old Commonwealth did not collapse, that word is sometimes used. It was destroyed. It was destroyed from the outside precisely because the Commonwealth was a threat geopolitically and ideologically to the neighboring absolute monarchies, especially the Russian Empire. There was, there is a, a particular part of the fourth article of the Constitution on the peasants. Uh, Dorot has already mentioned the extraordinarily important uh, encompassing of the peasants as the most numerous and useful part of the nation. But there is a specific point there that as soon as any migrants into the Commonwealth, the phrase used is the, uh, the territories of the Commonwealth. Uh, steps on Polish soil, they are a free person. Even if they've left the Commonwealth and come back again, they can go to a town, they can learn a trade, they can contract for their labor in order to run a farm. Uh, and that infuriated and outraged the Empress Catherine II. And she was afraid that serfs from the Russian Empire would en masse migrate to the Commonwealth. And in Vienna and Berlin, there were fears that burghers in over-regulated, over-taxed towns would find the life in Polish-Lithuanian towns more attractive and migrate there as well. So this potential, this threatening potential, had to be destroyed. And the consequences of that destruction were that the Commonwealth could not evolve in that way envisaged by the constitution and applauded by Burke. It took an entirely different path of insurrectionary uh, republicanism, uh, a romantic uh, uh, idea of the spirit uh, and a kind of uh, uh, shifting between sort of euphoria of uprisings and despair of being subjugated once more. Those are no conditions for any kind of normal politics. And so the constitution changed its meaning. It became a symbol. It became a symbol of the nation's desire for independence and sovereignty. But now, 2021, it's more than 30 years since Poland and Lithuania have regained their independence and sovereignty. And it's not surprising that celebrating the aspiration to sovereignty isn't really enough to get people you know, involved in those celebrations anymore. So what's the real message, I think, today in 2021? 
it's not so much an aspiration to sovereignty, it's what you do with that sovereignty and independence when you've got it. And in a very short space of time, the creators of the constitution of the 3rd of May, King Stanislav August, Ignacy Potocki, Stanislav Małachowski, Hugo Kowante, and others, were capable of forging a compromise and allowing for the evolutionary changes of the Commonwealth under the slogan of orderly freedom, Jondna Volnosch, uh, as opposed to the an aristocratic anarchy of the past or revolutionary terror or absolute monarchy. In that sense, there's a very Polish virtue here, the golden mean. Wow, I'm, I, I'm glad we're recording that so they use it and then read it out to my kids that they learn how, how to identify and understand what the meaning of constitution is. Kevin, is the American constitution sacralized and, and what is its legacy today? How would you respond to this? Oh, it's, it's simple I, and I, I, can, I can be quite brief here. It, it, it absolutely is sacralized and, and is something that Americans, for, for, for many good reasons, uh, embrace as, as, as a, uh, a way for the nation to cohere. Uh, your, your reference to President Biden uh, earlier today uh, it was spot on. Uh, we the people is, is a touchstone for Americans. Um, what I find useful about these kinds of conversations and why I'm so glad that Mount Vernon could be a part of this is that our understanding of that 18th century constitution, even though it has been changed in, in important ways since then, um, is, is more fully fledged, more fully developed by understanding how people in that world, George Washington was the presiding uh, official for the drafting of the constitution, understood the other constitutions that they see taking shape around them, understood and made sense of this transatlantic uh, Republican phenomenon. It helps us today, and Americans spend a lot of time trying to interpret their constitution, it helps us to make sense of what they believe that constitution was all about. And so the, the kinds of Burkean conservative understandings of what a good constitution is, I think is, is quite useful and important for Americans today to, to understand what their constitution is. And believe me, we talk about it in, in in every waking moment in some way or another, uh, trying to make sense of that document. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll be very happy to hear more opinions from Martin and, and Dorota, but we are actually almost running out of time. So I want to take uh, one question uh, from the audience here. Um, it's, I think Richard would be the, the first person to, to, to address it. Uh, what role, if any, did Tadeusz Kościuszko play in the Third May Constitution? Did, he, did his experience as an officer in the American Revolutionary War inform his ideas on this score? A question by Matthew Widomski. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, Kościuszko was far from enthusiastic about the Third of May Constitution, uh, partly on the basis of his experiences in America. And remember, he freed the slaves he was given uh, as a reward for uh, his service. And, in his, and later on in his testament, he provided for them to be uh, freed from his estate. Unfortunately, Jefferson didn't carry that out. Anyway, Kostyushko thought that the constitution of the 3rd of May didn't go far enough in terms of what it did for the peasants. Uh, and he thought that overall it was too monarchical and not Republican enough. Nevertheless, when he stood at the head of the insurrection of 1794, it was on the basis of abolishing all of the changes made by the counter-revolutionary Russian-sponsored regime that had been imposed since 1792, which meant that the constitution was, and the laws of the four years same were restored, at least until such time as the nation would be able to decide for itself uh, what the constitutional form would be. And let's also remember that Kostyushko fought very hard to defend the constitution in the war against Russia in 1792. Um, I would be happy to ask more questions and I, unfortunately I cannot take uh, others from, from the audience, uh, but I think it was very interesting and informing at least to me, uh, meeting and conversation. And it's amazing to have the perspective of not only of scholars of different fields, but also um, from various, I would say, geographical perspectives. So thank you very much to Kevin Butterfield and Mount Vernon.
for doing it together and for collaborating in this uh, in this organizing this roundtable. Thank you to Richard Butterwick and Dorota Pietrzyk Weaves and Martin Reddy for finding a time to celebrate with us and with the Pilecki Institute the 230th anniversary of the Constitution of 3rd May. Thank you, and I hope I will see you again in the future. Goodbye.